Okay, so my talk is basically giving you an overview, overview what Cherenkov actually is, because many of you may not be that familiar with it. And at the end, there are only a few data from my lab. And the co-worker or co-speakers will talk about their work and get you a little bit more into different applications. So I'd like to start <clears throat> with this slide, which gives you a little bit of the history. And even though it's named Cherenkov, the first person who actually described this event first was Madame Marie Curie. Because she wrote in her autobiography, and you can read it there, um, I don't want to read everything, but you can see that she wrote about feebly luminous silhouettes of the bottles which had her products, i.e. the radioactive products in it. And she said it was a lovely sight and uh, new for her, and the glow glowing tubes looked like faint fairy lights. <clears throat> which also tells you, hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will realize that she had a lot of activity in there. Um, then Mr. Cherenkov, Pavel Cherenkov, he described this in the more physical terms, and he got, in 1958, the Nobel Prize for this, together with uh, Frank and Tam, who came up with an equation for this. And he also said in his uh, laureate talk, one of extraordinary, it's an observation of extraordinary interest, not only on account of its significance in principle, but also in regard to the many practical possibilities for its use. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like. What you see here is a nuclear reactor. And here you see a cooling basin in a nuclear reactor. And the blue light you see is actually the Cherenkov. So there are no lamps in there, which was, I actually also originally thought that they have some lights in there to see what is in there. No, it is actually the Cherenkov itself. The Cherenkov itself is a continuous spectrum peaking at around 380 in this area and then dropping down continuously. It's polarized light. And the key sentence is, you get Cherenkov light when a charged particle travels through a dielectric medium faster than the speed of light in that medium. And I often get asked, well, how is that possible? <clears throat> and because there's nothing faster than the speed of light, but that only refers to vacuum. So water travels slower than in vacuum. Uh, light travels slower in water than in vacuum. So you can have charged particles, beta particles, or um, electrons. You can have those traveling faster than the speed of light. And what happens then is that you get the light. Now, this is a movie I got from the internet, you see the link down there from YouTube. This is from the UPenn nuclear reactor. And what they did is they have a control rod in here and they pull this control rod. You hear them counting backwards and they pull the control rod. And let's hope this works. Can't hear them counting, that's fine. That's when they uh, pulled the rod and now the rod goes back in. And the flash you saw there was Cherenkov light coming out of the reactor at the moment when the reactor wasn't um, turned down anymore, but was starting to gear up and all the particles were flowing around. Now, if you remember Madame Curie, and I showed you all these uh, images from nuclear reactors, if, you, if she could see that, uh, she really had a lot of activity in there. And of course, she died later on of cancer. Now, nuclear physicists are using especially nuclear engineers are using Cherenkov for a long time to see how much fuel they have in the fuel rods based on the light they get. They also can see that the reactor starts up. Um, physicists, uh, especially astrophysicists, are using actually Cherenkov telescopes to detect cosmic gamma ray bursts. If the gamma ray comes in, it reacts with ions in the atmosphere. Apparently that's enough. Then they get a shower of Cherenkov light down there and they're very highly sensitive um, telescopes. These two are on the Canary Islands, have a mirror here, which reflects the light into the very sensitive detector. So in physics, this was known for some time. This again shows you um, basically the cone of blue light coming from the particle traveling higher than the speed of light. There are some explanations really how this works. I'm not a physicist, so you can go into the books if you want. Some people compare it to the ultrasonic uh, boom of a plane, which is not quite correct, but it sort of gives you the idea. This was actually the apparatus Cherenkov used to look at it. The radioactivity was in here. He had a prism or a mirror here and looked in there. And I think he said that he needs to sit for quite some time in the dark before he actually can start looking in it. Uh, to see it with his own eyes, which also tells you that, or he also must have looked at at least quite some activity if you can see it with your own eyes. 
I'll get to that later. <clears throat> These are some of the first experiments we did after in about 2010. It was described the first time that you can do this for imaging. Um, here we have tubes, Appendorf tubes obviously, filled with different amounts of radioactivity. This was zirconium-89. This is the PET image and this is the image on an IVIS scanner and you see the activity uh, correlating to the amount of light you get out there. At the beginning what we did is we put a piece of paper on top of it to really prove that what we see is not some uh, particles hitting the cameras but really the light and indeed if you put a piece of paper over it you don't get any signal anymore other than the occasional gamma which hits the camera but this is really uh, light. It also shows you already here a nice difference between PET and Cherenkov which is that on Cherenkov you have, uh, on PET you have not a really good idea what is actually going on there. You've got some signal where it's coming from, you have no idea. And on the Cherenkov, as with any optical imaging, you can overlay a white light image and get sort of an anatomical, in parentheses, reference. Um, here's something about the path length. Uh, there were simulations done. Simon Cherry did some uh, in, in, at Sloan, some were done. This basically shows you that for F18, uh, the uh, red shows you the path of the better and this is the path where it produces light and then if it goes under the speed of light this is I think you can see what color it is from here uh, it's bluish that's how the better continues but under the speed of light which means there is no Cherenkov produced anymore and this is around uh, the nucleus the distance where you get the Cherenkov which is about a one millimeter resolution here if you go to yttrium 90 you see that this goes much further at several millimeters and the reason for that is that of the the energy of the particles from the yttrium which is not a better of course it's an electron um, is much more energetic it's used for therapy so you have more energy so it travels faster for a longer time and you get more Cherenkov over that distance. The Cherenkov also depends according to the Frank Tem solution on the um, refractive index with increasing refractive index, you get more light on there. This can be calculated for different tracers. Um, the higher the refractive index, the more light comes out of your medium. <clears throat> now, in terms of resolution, that's an interesting question. What is the resolution of Cherenkov? If you compare it with PET, which is sort of unfair in a certain way because there are different modalities, the Cherenkov is a surface weighted optical imaging modality and the PET of course is tomographic but still if you look at the resolution this is a normal PET phantom a normal resolution so we didn't use the high, high resolution but we also did not use the worst uh, resolution you can get the standard resolution we use your resolution is okay there and then it drops down while on the Cherenkov image you can see even the smallest of these uh, phantom wells very well and this is the phantom and this is the overlay so at least for the surface you get a nice resolution with Cherenkov, which is at least better for PET or let's say in general scintigraphy. Now what might then be the advantage so far? Um, this is the Cherenkov light, this is the PET image. The PET takes about 20 minutes to acquire on one mouse. If you have set up so you can put more mice in there, even better for you. The Cherenkov, depending on the activity, takes with an IVIS camera between one to three, four minutes to acquire. It's very low light. It's not like your usual fluorescence where you can see it live online. You really have to acquire four minutes. Um, but with the Cherenkov, you can image more animals in less time. If you know the IVIS scanner, you can put five animals in there at the same time and image those. Um, the optical image is uh, cheaper to get than the PET scanner. The optical scanner is cheaper. Uh, I mentioned the higher throughput, uh, sort of higher throughput, I repeat, sorry. And we sometimes say it's the cheap man's pet because if you don't have a pet scanner, you can still use FDG, can check what your tumor is doing by using uh, the chunk. If you don't get tomographic images, but you get an idea and some people at Sloan uh, start using Cherenkov to first get an idea of what time point might be ideal and when they found it out with Cherenkov then they go into the way more expensive and more time consuming PET. Doses are the same. This is again the spectrum for the Cherenkov, a little bit coarser but going out further here and as many of you hopefully already may have thought well this is blue light so it's basically the opposite of what we taught all the time. Blue light is not ideal for imaging, highly absorbance uh, and scatter and if you overlay it with the usual spectrum what is always shown 
it's not really in the near infrared window, of course. It's right there. We basically don't want to have your signal. So one reason that we still can see it is that it drops down, so we see a relatively more light of the Cherenkov coming in the red-greenish area than in the blue area, depending on how deep the signal is. But another thing what we also thought is why not using the Cherenkov, and not only us, uh, my, my co-speaker, the next speaker, um, also was thinking about that in another group in St. Louis as well. Why not using it to excite actually fluorochromes? So what you could do then is you use the Cherenkov light, which is bluish, and you excite the fluorochrome, and your fluorochrome gives you another signal. And remember, you still have the PET signal, and you still also have the Cherenkov signal. So what you get at the end is the setup on the right. You get a PET image, which you can acquire. You also get the Cherenkov light from the radionuclide, what I've basically shown you so far. And you can use the emission from the Cherenkov to excite another fluorochrome, and then you get something which we fancily call sci-fi, which is secondary Cherenkov-induced fluorescence imaging. Other people had other names. Uh, we like this one. Now, you can excite a variety of fluorochromes with it. These shows you various tubes with the different chromes, fluorochromes in there. The first one is water. Then um, Clockwise is FITSI, CY5.5, and CY7, and then three different quantum dots. Quantum dots are very nice for Cherenkov because they're all excited in the blue range, no matter what emission they have. Um, what we see here in the middle, that is the FDG, and if we take out that FDG, we can see, uh, because the intensity is lower of the excited fluorochromes, all the other fluorochromes. Um, here you see in the GFP filter from the IVIS that you can see FITSI, and uh, the green quantum dot very well. CY 5.5 filter in there. The CY dyes are not very well excited by the Cherenkov because their excitation spectrum is so far in the near infrared. But if you look at all the three quantum dots, uh, you can see them very nicely, which is reflected in these bar graphs where the appropriate filters are put in there. And then you can see if we put, for example, a 6 to 5 filter in there, most signal we get is, of course, from the 600 quantum dot, etc. And it also tells you that FITSI is a very nice one, um, excited nicely in the blue area. And with the GFP filter, this is the, how, how the IVIS names the filters, um, you get a nice signal. FITSI, of course, is nice because it is clinically approved. So there are some potentials in there. Now. Why would we do that if we still go down further with the signal? Uh, we excite with an already very low signal, and then we get something which certainly is not higher. That's against the laws of physics. Um, one advantage we found is that you basically get a better signal uh, to noise ratio. If you look at this setup, this mouse has a tube in uh, the belly, and the tube had Fitzy in it and gallium 68. And we did the what we call sci-fi image, and we did the normal fluorescence image. With the normal fluorescence image, um, and this is wrong, this is the sci-fi, this is the fluorescence. Uh, so on the left here, this is the fluorescence, you have the external excitation, and then you get a, your emission. But together with the external excitation, you also get backscatter, and you get your reflectance of your light, which you shine onto the mouse, and that deteriorates your signal-to-noise ratio. So you get a signal-to-noise ratio um, with the fluorescence, and this is also all wrong. I had to redo all these slides for the white screen. This is what happens. Um, so with the sci-fi, which is this here, you get a signal to noise of 155. And with the fluorescence, which is this here, so forget about this, uh, you get a signal to noise of 27.7. So this is about six times better for the sci-fi image. And you can see the mouse looks nicely red here. This is all your background signal, which deteriorates your signal. And if you quantify it, um, again, this is your difference. So even though this is low light signal, with this uh, two-step uh, excitation or this internal excitation of fluorochromes, because you don't need external light, you use the uh, Cherenkov light, which is coming from within the mouse. If you have, the, for example, FDG in the tumor, you get a better signal to noise ratio. Five times six better. Now, this is, shows you some multiplexed imaging. Uh, colleagues have done. Um, this is from um, St. Louis where they injected uh, quantum dots and could see the quantum dots injected by the FDG. I think in this case they injected them 
with the FDG together, and these are various fluochromes, uh, various quantum dots injected in a mouse which has FDG that is coming from Stanford, and you see, you can see all the quantum dots excited again by the Cherenkov. Now what we did is we took a quantum dot and put a RGD on there, and here a scrambled peptide, RID, a different one, and we also had zirconium uh, 89 on Herceptin, and the tumor here was HER2 positive. And you can see here again, this is the spectrum. This is the blue one is the Cherenkov. The red one is here, the peak of the quantum dot at the 605 level. And when the quantum dot is in there, the Cherenkov peak goes down because the quantum dot absorbs the light. And if you let the FDG, which was in here, um, decay, you don't get any signal either from the quantum dot nor the Cherenkov. Now, this is the PET image. Both tumors are HER2 positive, so you see the PET signal, which tells you there is HER2. Here is the Cherenkov image, and you see that, of course, in both, in both mice as well. And here is the RGD quantum dot, which binds to these tumors which are RGD positive. And here is the scrambled peptide, which doesn't bind to uh, the alpha V beta 3 integrin, and you don't get a signal here as a control. Now, what this tells you, you can do nice tricks. You can really look at two different molecular events. So we can say this is HER2 positive, and it's also alpha V beta 3 positive through this um, combined signal. Now, is there any clinical use of it? Um, you can do optical imaging of approved radio tracers. And there are very few optical agents approved. Um, there may be some um, even bigger problems, as I heard that some companies are actually going away from using uh, clinically approved imaging agents, optical imaging agents. And you could that then use for endoscopy or intraoperative imaging. So for any surface weighted imaging which you can uh, think of. Laparoscopic is very nice because the belly is still closed, so it's nice and dark in there, at least darker uh, as opposed to open surgery. Robotic surgery allows you for even better radiation shielding because uh, most of the people at least are standing further away. And I know that the companies have some interest in Cherenkov who are doing the Da Vinci. Uh, and it allows, as I've shown you, for true multimodality imaging, you really get a PET image and an optical image from the same agent, so you don't need a fluochrome coupled to a radio tracer, it's all one and the same. And you can do, therefore, a nice uh, pre- and post-operative PET, for example, mapping, I'll show you that, and then Cherenkov for the surgery. This is a simple example we did as a proof of principle. Here is uh, the tumor, again, we imaged with an antibody. I think it was, again, Herceptin, positive, HER2 negative. Here you see uh, the Cherenkov image. Here the skin is opened, you see the clamp. Cherenkov light goes up a little bit because the absorbing skin is gone. Here the tumor is cut out, lying there. Tumor alone, mouse is again closed up and we don't see any signal coming out from the tumor bed. Now we also did some sentinel lymph node imaging and resection and there will be a talk, uh, I think, then when is it tomorrow? Tomorrow. Um, you see, and I don't want to go into too much details here, this will be done tomorrow in the scientific session. If FDG is injected in the skin here, you see the lymph nodes lighting up at various stages, going up here. This is the Cherenkov light, and on the upper one, you see the intradermal injection, and you see the lymph node lighting up here in blue, and then in the little box, you see the lymph node excised, and the skin was removed, but the muscles were still overlying uh, the lymph node. Here, the FDG was injected IV, and you see a little bit the kidney showing through, but you don't see any of the lymph nodes, and you can do a nice 3D reconstructions, and if you imagine you also have the vascularity, um, on there, the surgeons can get a very nice image of the lymph nodes, and our um, GYN and breast surgeons are already very interested in this. This will also be in the next uh, JNM where it's on the title. Now, you can do ex vivo human specimen. This was in collaboration with Cornell, where they injected uh, J591 coupled with zirconium, zirconium through Jason Lewis lab in MSKCC. And the J591 is from Neil Bender at Cornell, an antibody that binds PSMA. The patients got this agent injected before surgery. And then we got the prostate together with them 
when it was removed, put it in our uh, now specialized Cherenkov box, and you can see light coming out of um, the prostate. This is just a pilot, uh, so there's a lot of confirmation still to be done, but this is one possible application where you can do immediate ex vivo control. Now, just to summarize advantages and disadvantages so far, uh, we think advantages are higher throughput. You can do five mice, five mice in depending on your activity, five minutes versus uh, one mouse in 20 minutes if you don't have a multi-mouse uh, setup in your pet. It's still certainly cheaper than a PET scanner to do uh, Cherenkov imaging, five times about if you think about what these instruments are costing. Um, you get the better signal to noise if you excite a fluochrome with the uh, Cherenkov uh, compared to reflective fluorescence imaging. It gives you at least on the surface a higher resolution with a PET. It's of course not tomographic. And you can use, and I think this is a big advantage, approved radio tracers and can do optical imaging with them right away. Uh, of course, you can do it right away on the patients, but it's considerably easier to get approval from ethical committees if you have something which has already been used in patients than if you come with a new fluorochrome. Now, what are the disadvantages? Again, it's a very low signal intensity compared to anything so far. It's about 10 times lower than bioluminescence, so you really need to be very, very strict with excluding any um, ambient light. Um, as soon as you've got ambient light, especially in a clinical setting, it's difficult to say if there's a real signal or not. But these are, uh, as we think, technical challenges, and we're currently uh, working more and more on this. Um, therefore, you need long imaging times compared to reflectance imaging, uh, fluorescence imaging. So you can't, like the nice images you see from all the fluorescent interoperative imaging, Basilis stuff, for example, out of Munich, you can't do online imaging and see how the surgeon cuts out the hotspot. But what you can do is similar to angiography, where you do a roadmap, you inject the contrast agents, you see the vessels, and that is then later overlaid on uh, wherever you're working. So you get an idea where you still are, and they can use this to probe uh, wherever they want to look for lymph nodes or tumors. Um, it demands no ambient light, I said that, and it requires, of course, radioactivity, um, which causes in some uh, areas concern. We did calculations so far that the doses to surgeons wouldn't be much higher uh, than for, for other applications, and also they are, at least at Sloan, using radioactivity at least for sentinel lymph node imaging already and probe. Now, another advantage which I should actually put on here of the Cherenkov is, which you don't have with the fluorescence, you still have the radioactivity in there. So even if you don't see anything, you can probe for deeper lesions with the normal handheld radioactive probe. You can't do this with fluorescence. And in fact, a lot of fluorescence groups uh, working on fluorescence are thinking, should we put uh, radioactivity on our fluorescent label to be able to see deeper down? Uh, the Cherenkov has this sort of built in, so you don't need to worry about that. Now, I think this is my last slide. Um, the biggest challenge is the low signal intensity. I uh, elaborated on that. Radio exposure to surgeons and patients, we think this is uh, not worrisome, especially not in cancer patients, and you can do precautions for the surgeons. Um, it will be challenging in an OR setting, but again, this is technical, and we uh, have several ideas how to work around that. Uh, laparoscopy, endoscopy, um, you will see this in the next talk as examples. Darkening the OR to a certain uh, extent and using additional filters in the setup so that you can exclude the ambient light through additional filter settings. And with that, I thank you. I think I've stayed more or less in time, and I just have to need to point out uh, that almost all of this work was done by my postdoc, Dan Thorak,